Just the cameras and stuff for that. Well, oh, he should know. Well, he did. He said five. Okay. I was the one that raised the doubt. <laughs> no, I you ever feel not listening to that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, because that's where we're getting the audio. It's 5:30, guys. Let's start this party. Okay. <clears throat> Meeting number 44 is now called to order. This October 21st, 2019, it is 5:30 p.m. And we're in the Thomas J. Smith Council Chambers. Would you all please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance? <clears throat> I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sorry. Thank you. I jumped the gun. Oh, man, you're good. Kathleen, let's do roll call, please. Graham Murray. Here. McCampbell. Here. Linker. Wilson. Phillips. Happy to be here. All right. See, Steve's better half is in the house. All right. Uh, first on the agenda tonight is uh, the consent agenda. All matters listed under item one consent agenda having been discussed are considered to be routine by the city council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussions of these items. If a discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Uh, on the uh, consent tonight, we have the usual finances and miscellaneous, minutes of previous meetings, payroll and city claims, beer, liquor, wine and cigarettes, reports and bonds. We have four resolutions. Uh, the first is a resolution approving nuisance abatements for various properties. The second is a resolution establishing a no parking area on the east side of the 200 block of South Woodlawn Avenue. The third is a resolution approving an agreement between the City of Burlington, Iowa, and Alliant Energy Incorporated for all-night lighting service on Horizon Street. And then the fourth is a resolution approving side agreement between CWA Local 7176 and the City of Burlington. We also have a public, clear, public hearing set for November 4th. Um, a consideration of plans and specs for the 2019 Lewis Street sewer repair project. Is there anybody that would like to have any of these items removed? I see none. Council? No. Your Honor, I have a motion to approve all listed under the consent agenda. I'm jumping the gun, sorry. Second. Yes, sir. Second. I got it ready. Yeah, let's do it. Graham Murray. <laughs> Aye. McCampbell? Aye. Phillips? Aye. Okay. Well, first we have a uh, hearing. is a consideration of an ordinance amending section 58.13, type A permit, general standards of chapter 58, noise control of the Burlington Municipal Code. Um, who's coming on that? Major? Oh. Major Grimshaw. Welcome. So essentially we are um, requesting a change from the type A permit on the noise ordinance. Uh, from a uh, maximum allowable time under the authority of that permit to 11 p.m. instead of 9 p.m. And that's on the type A, which includes all commercial properties. Any, any establishment that's located within a commercial and a non-residential area. And it, it would still, for some of, it would still be up to the chief's discretion though? Correct. I'm, good. Yeah, they would still have to apply for the permit. Mm -hmm. uh, but instead now it's, it's um, recognized as a permit applicable up to 11 p.m. instead of 9 p.m. It could go later, but that's, again, special consideration. But now it would just reflect the 11 p.m. instead of the 9 p.m. in the ordinance. Okay. Peanut butter? And if someone had an issue, they would just call and you'd check the decibels out? or Correct. Okay. Correct. One and done. One morning. <laughs> Questions or concerns from the audience? I see none. Thank you, Major. Yes, sir. Kathleen. I need to close here. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Your Honor, I have a motion to close. Second. It's, it's going to be one of those meetings I, I tonight. know. I started it's the, the bad thing. It's the pink thing. paper. That's what it is. All right. Graham Murray. Aye. McCampbell. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Your Honor, I have a motion for the preliminary adoption of the first reading of an ordinance amending Section 58.13, Type A Permit, General Standards of the Chapter 58 <coughs> Noise Control of the Burlington Municipal Code. I really Second. Second. Yeah. Shane. Graham Murray. Aye. McCampbell. Aye. Phillips. Aye. Okay. Ordinances. Your Honor, I have a motion for the preliminary adoption for the second reading of the ordinance vacating and selling a portion of the right of way located adjacent to 1815 1845 Des Moines Avenue, Burlington, Iowa. Second. Second. Thank you, sir. Uh, 
no changes from the previous reading. This again, Carly Nelson, owner of all property uh, east and west of the alley running north and south from Core Street and uh, adjacent to the east-west uh, former Cash Street right away um, has requested vacating these two right of ways. Uh, they're looking to make improvements to the uh, alley and the driveway access and um, based on their owning all property around there and being the primary user, they wanted to own the property if they're gonna make uh, improvements to the property and um, their goal is to make it a, a smoother ride for sure. themselves, which would also benefit the na neighbor to the north, so. Right on. Questions or concerns from the audience on that? I see none. Council? Yeah. Is this one we want to consider? Can we waive it and go to the final reading on this? We got final next week. Oh, final is next week. Okay. Mm -hmm. Never mind. Peanut butter? I'm good. Mr. Rinker, are you satisfied? Are you got any uh, anything to add on the uh, ordinance no. number one? Nope. Okay. Kathleen, let's vote. Graham Murray? Aye. Ms. Campbell? Aye. Rinker? Aye. Phillips. Aye. Okay, resolutions. Your Honor, I have a resolution approving the application of funds through the Community Catalyst Building Remediation Program from the Iowa Economic Development Authority. Second. Second. Thank you. This is a grant application uh, through the city uh, for the property um, at 300 Washington Street, the former typewriter building. Uh, owned by Downtown Partners, Inc., uh, DPI. Uh, this grant does uh, go through the city. Uh, as previously discussed at the work session, we added uh, some additional language to the previous resolution, um, I guess somewhat guaranteeing or ensuring that the city is backed if uh, they do not meet all the requirements of the grant application, um, specifically uh, the third, whereas Downtown Partners is procuring a letter of credit to guarantee repayment of IEDA funds to the City of Burlington should terms of the Community Catalyst Building Remediation <coughs> Program not be met. And uh, in the last uh, portion of the uh, resolution, um, authorizes 20, contribution of $20,000 towards the, from the City Economic Development Funds towards the project contingent upon the City's receipt of a letter of credit from DPI as described above. Um, so essentially this is a $100,000 uh, forgivable loan or grant uh, through IEDA uh, to help stabilize the building at um, 300 Washington Street. Uh, if the uh, DPI fails to sell or transfer ownership of the building within 12 months, I believe that's from July of 2020 is the start time on that, uh, then they would have to repay that uh, as a loan and not as a grant. Uh, but since it comes through the city, it's uh, the city's responsibility, and that's why uh, we're asking for a letter of credit to back that up. $20,000 from the city is not a forgivable loan. That is just a straight grant. Uh, the Economic Development Committee had previously approved uh, that portion, recommended this, the council approve the, that $20,000 towards this project. I don't know if you wanted to go kind of over what you're trying to, the scope of work you're trying to accomplish with this sure. again. Steve Freebird, Executive Director of Downtown Partners, and I know a lot of you heard this last week, but I know the mayor wasn't uh, here, so. Um, I saw it on TV, my friend. If you, did you, so do you want me to skip over some of you it? Can or, skim, okay. Yeah, you can skip okay. over it. So uh, I think Eric and Jim laid out pretty, pretty well. Um, we do not want uh, the city to take on the risk of having to pay back $100,000 forgivable uh, loans. So um, we are continuing to meet with contractors, just met with one for quite a while this afternoon. I think we're within about a week of identifying a contractor who we can go ahead with. At that point, when we know the dollars involved in this project, um, we can approach the banks uh, for the, the letter of credit, the, the financing that we're gonna need to get through it because uh, the way this funding would work is uh, the reimbur it's a reimbursable grant, uh, so the first a uh, chunk of money would be uh, reimbursed uh, after 60% uh, of the project is complete, and then the rest of it after the project is, is finally completed and inspected. After it's complete or after the, the, the completion date? After, after the work is completed, okay. yeah. So, um, like Eric said, uh, the, the state is being uh, very flexible with this. They know this is an unusual situation. Uh, and so they've stated that uh, that 12 month clock won't start ticking until uh, July 1st of next year. So we would have 
until July 1st, 2021 to have the building sold to a developer with a plan for occupancy. Uh, and I, I can certainly answer other questions as well, too, so. I don't have any questions, but um, deals like this just make me a little bit nervous, you know what I'm saying? And that's why we want to be sure that we're covering any risk that the city might have. I, I'm, I'm confident that uh, not only are we going to stabilize the building, we're going to fix the problems with it that to re have really prevented it from being sold. Um, the corner situation with the masonry, uh, that's obviously the primary consideration, uh, but there are some other uh, tasks on the inside that we think we can tackle that are really going to help move the building. You said you had two of the, uh, what was that? The trusses. The trusses, but there's mm -hmm. still one truss. That there, there's one that's, that's shored up in place and it's not moving because it rests on a, an existing wall. Uh, but the end of it's bad, and so we have a quote for 22000 to fix that final uh, third of the three trusses that were bad. Uh, we've received a $10,000 grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation specifically to go towards that part of the project. So, um, I, you know, I'm looking, again, I'm, I'm not a, an engineer and I'm not a contractor, but I think we're looking at somewhere between $170,000 to $240,000 for the, the entire project. Uh, that's the corner of the building, but also remediating uh, some of the remaining asbestos underneath the first floor, uh, shoring up that truss or repairing that truss and uh, demolishing all the interior partitions on the second floor, which are really problematic. So um, downtown partners already has a, a, some of that funding on hand and we're applying for additional. So uh, I don't s foresee having to go out uh, and asking banks to, to back a quarter million dollar loan because I think we're going to have a, a fair amount of that already in hand. And, and I'll add that as of last week, um, the Greater Burlington Partnerships Economic Development Committee um, had uh, loaned downtown partners sixty thousand to get this done, and they've uh, at their board last Tuesday approved uh, putting off first repayment of that loan until July 1st, 2021. The same, so the same deadline as, as IEDA is putting on it. So, um, you know, I see no reason why this work would take that long, but we know we're heading into winter. Um, talking with the contractor we met with today, I think we'll probably work on the, uh, shoring the interior um, this winter, um, building an interior wall um, and uh, brickwork uh, on the facade probably taking place in the spring depending on, again, very weather dependent, so. Now, Steve. Let me, let me get the audience first and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, questions from the audience, anybody? We're good? Okay, uh, peanut butter? You said there's been uh, some interest in the building? Yeah, we've had the building listed for a little over a year uh, with Terrace Realty and um, I know they've shown some developers through the building. I've, I've shown a couple through there myself. Um, Right now, there's a lot of large buildings on the market downtown. Uh, some of them are kind of in play. There's, there's um, some behind the scenes things happening with a few of those. Um, and I think, you know, what, uh, depending on the available inventory, that's gonna make a difference. So if a couple of those bigger buildings get sold, all of a sudden, ours moves up on the list. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's in the toughest shape <coughs> of any of them listed that I know of, so. But sometimes, somebody looking for something, if we're able to tell them this work is going to be finished, if oh, that yeah. was one of their objections, yep. maybe we can move the sale of this through quicker than we ever thought possible. Yeah, you know, you never know who's out there. We do know that there is um, uh, some interest locally, uh, kind of a, a group that's looking to put some project together, um, almost as a backstop, but, uh, you know, we're certainly open to, mm -hmm. to any developable developable offers um you know what i talked about last week is we know that the size of the lot is the same as the washington right next door and that that lot is valued at eight thousand dollars so um downtown partners has spent two hundred thirty thousand dollars on uh, improving the building so far uh we're looking to spend you know say roughly another 200 um and i think it'll be money well spent we know we're not going to get that money back out of it uh, but we are here to uh, preserve uh, the character of downtown uh, and to, uh, to preserve the city's tax base and certainly creating another empty lot on the block <coughs> that uh, already half of that block physically uh, is, is empty lots, is parking lots right now. So uh, another empty lot is not going to help the tax base. But uh, 
we think by getting this building repaired, getting it sold to a developer, uh, we're going to uh, um, preserve the historic character of this portion of downtown. Uh, we are going to uh, bolster the city's tax base and, and uh, create an economic development benefit, uh, whether that's uh, for housing, for uh, employment, for jobs, or, or as a, a entertainment venue or whatever. Um, I think there's, there's a lot more potential there than if it was an empty lot. Mm -hmm. I agree. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so, assuming your assuming everything goes great on your plans, I'll be for it. But what happens if the plans don't work? What is our out? The credit, the bank credit. The, there. What? But you don't credit. have that bank. Well, no, because we don't know that exact number to ask for. But well, we don't approve this unless that's had. No, you you approve this, but it has a contingency what? clause in it. That's right. 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 I just wanted to clarify that we have the contingency. So without the credit the line of credit, then this doesn't go through. Right. So thus eliminating the risk for the city yeah. for the loan. Right. Okay. Yeah, and, and we you know there. this this also kind of speeds up the process a little bit just in case depending on where it falls with the council meeting schedule, we don't have to wait another two weeks to bring it forward. Sure. Sure. So. Okay, thanks, okay. Steve. Thank you. Satisfied? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Freebert. Kathleen. Graham Murray. Aye. McCampbell. Aye. Rinker. Yes. Phillips. Aye. All right. Next. You're going to have a resolution establishing free parking in certain public parking lots. Need a second. 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 Go ahead. Downtown uh, Parking Committee has uh, continued to look at uh, ways to improve parking in the downtown uh, based on comments and use of the parking lots downtown. Uh, one thing that was uh, examined was the, uh, I guess, lack of use of some parking lots downtown that are in good condition and, uh, I guess, somewhat desirable locations. Um, so we have brought forward the recommendation to uh, create three additional uh, free public parking lots in the downtown to more disperse the free lots uh, throughout the downtown uh, with those being at 6th and Washington, 5th uh, and Valley, and the 3rd and Washington upper ramp. Um, this would still allow lease spaces if someone wants to lease a space for 24 hours or uh, 730 to 5 to guarantee they have a spot. Um, but if they do not lease a spot, it would be free open to the public uh, on a 24-hour basis. So you couldn't leave a car there uh, for two or three days during the week. Um, so if you if that's your desire, whether it's a business or downtown residence, then uh, the option would still be there to lease spaces. Um, currently, we have uh, three lease spaces in the 6th and Washington lot um, for a, a business there, uh, zero in the 5th and Valley lot, and about 25 in the 3rd and Washington upper ramp. Um, uh, this is uh, kind of in conjunction with the following two resolutions as well, um, trying to improve parking in the downtown. Okay. Questions from the audience? I see none. Council? Just yeah. Go ahead. Real briefly, uh, yeah, Downtown Partners uh, is very much in support of this. I'm sorry, I your name too. Oh, yeah, address, sir. Steve Freebert, Executive Director of Downtown Partners. Uh, we're very much in favor of this and, and the following two resolutions. Uh, we know that there um, is a perception that the parking is an issue downtown. Uh, and, and so, you know, the council's already taken the step of, of changing the four hour to three hour. Um, we haven't seen, I don't think, a big change in the number of people who are uh, shuffling their cars around on the street, the downtown employees, um, by giving them the opportunity to, uh, to park for free all day long. Uh, I, I think it's, it makes better use of the city's resources and hopefully frees up some on-street parking uh, for, for visitors and, and shoppers. Um, so that's... That's the carrot and the stick is yet to come, so. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Any I, other comments from the audience? Council. I, I have one, Eric. I had, I had a uh, citizen ask me why we didn't list some of the other lots, like 7th Street. But 7th Street is pretty much all free parking now anyway. Yeah, 7th right? is why we're not changing. free. Uh, I think it's a 48-hour limit there. There is some reserve right. there as well. But uh, on the map here, any of the goldish uh, lots are already free. Um, we just had a handful in the core area that were uh, leased or paid by the hour. Yeah, I just wanted to get that out because I know they were watching today. So. And there's okay. two lots that do remain uh, pretty much fully leased, uh, and those are not being suggested to change based on the use of those lots. Um, these lots could potentially change down the road if, uh, for example, the former police station 
uh, develops uh, per the request from the developer. And there's uh, 48 units right next door, and the demand increases. Uh, in a few years, maybe that could change as well. But for now, this is seen as the, the best route. Good. Thanks. So, Eric, let's say somebody brand new to Burlington comes here and they're not really sure where to park. Where can they get information on that? Where are the brochures going to be? Um, we'll have uh, everything on our website and Facebook. Uh, we'll have them listed with the business. We'll distribute those to the businesses downtown as well. Uh, we'll be changing the signs uh, on those parking lots um, to say free public parking uh, 24 hours and pretty that'll be the major uh, I guess headline on those signs for those parking lots so hopefully that'll be very clear for them yeah I hope so thank you good okay, thanks counselor I'm good all right Kathleen Claire Murray aye McCampbell yes please Rinker yes Phillips yes all right uh, number, number four I'm sorry number three number three you want to no, do that, sure. Linda? Your Honor, I have a resolution eliminating certain on-street par reserved parking spaces. Uh, this again. Uh, second, sorry. Second. 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 Thank you. This again uh, reviewed by the Downtown Parking Committee. Um, based on availability in uh, parking in the areas and lack of uh, need for such reserved spaces. In these areas, there's generally uh, quite a bit of uh, available on-street parking. Uh, currently, uh, so this just uh, frees up some spaces for other users, whether it's closer to a building or closer to the use. Um, the areas looking at are uh, City Hall on 4th Street at 400 Washington, the Fire Department um, at 14 Valley on the Valley Street side, and the Post Office at 300 North Main, uh, retaining the two spaces on the north end of Main, uh, but re uh, eliminating the ones to, to on the southern end, uh, where there's quite a bit of parking on Jefferson as well. Um, again, as mentioned before, if uh, needs change, if the building at uh, the Blah building at Fifth and Valley uh, develops and there's uh, no parking, then maybe that's something you revisit for the fire department. But um, at this time, there's plenty of parking there. You're right. Up. Any issues from the audience? Questions or concerns? I see none. You guys have been fantastic tonight. And since I bring up the audience, just like to recognize uh, candidate Repke in the house tonight. Good to see you, sir. Okay, council. No questions here. Good. Kathleen, let's do it. Graham Murray. Hi. McCampbell. Hi. Rinker. <laughs> yes. Phillips. Hi. It's the hot tea. You're, I couldn't help you're myself. Honor, I have a resolution <laughs> approving a parking fine am amount. Sorry, sorry, the way she said hi is all, you know, happy birthday. <laughs> Yeah. It was Mr. very President. Marilyn Monroe-ish, I yes, agree. It was. It's the yeah. hot tea. I need where, a second. Where are we at? Second. Well, I can't second mine. Go ahead. Give me a second, Peter. Please. Second. <laughs> <laughs> I got that. <laughs> sorry for that. I think it goes I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <coughs> Reel it in. Reel it in. This, this again was brought forward by the Downtown Parking Committee. Uh, upon review of comparable communities parking fine rate and an effort to promote the use of off-street parking lots that uh, will be free uh, once those are changed, um, we felt the implementation of addition, uh, this uh, increase of fine from $10 to $15 was appropriate. Um, again, uh, the additional off -street, or free public parking in city-owned parking lots uh, and to encourage the movement of vehicles utilizing these on-street parking spaces. Uh, um, many of the other communities that similar size that we found were in that $15 range. There were some differences. Some had meters and some had increases after 72 hours or a week, but uh, 15 seemed to be pretty standard there. So we'd recommend uh, going to 15 and uh, recommendation that this go into effect January 1st, 2020, uh, so that the signs are up and brochures are distributed uh, in advance of that so that we uh, make sure we get the word out on that. Good deal. Good. Questions from the audience? I see none. Council? So if someone's brand new to our community and they make a mistake and park in the wrong spot, do we forgive that first ticket? We do not currently. Um, that's something we're looking at, whether there's a, a automated system that we can track that better, but currently with paper tickets and an Excel spreadsheet that's just not something we can do in the field, but that's something that we're looking at uh, that and as well as the uh, graduated fine system, whether if you're a five-time offender, maybe your fine goes up to $25 or something. But. And without that software, that's really what's prohibiting. Yeah, and I understand the reasoning, and the reason yeah. is, is if she's out on the street, 
pulls up to a car. She doesn't have the ability to determine whether or not that car is a prior offender or not. Or <coughs> so she issues the ticket. Well, if she issues the ticket and then comes back and finds out it's too late for her to go back and pull it, you know what I mean? So, Councilor? I'm good. So the major catalyst for this is to be in line with what other communities are doing? No, the major goal is to get people to use those free off-street parking lots that we just made free and uh, free up some of the on-street parking for uh, patrons and visitors to downtown and not just uh, residents or uh, workers of downtown so that we're making use of our off-street par public parking lots a little bit more. I guess I'd like to wait until we have the software to do some of the other fancy things you talked about. <clears throat> That's my input on it. Right on. Okay. Councilor? I'm good. You're good. Okay. I'm good. I was just going to say we were up in Davenport a couple of years ago, um, and they uh, they went out and purchased the software. Software. I was with Charlie at the time. I think their software was over twenty thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's not a, a small thing. That's just a software. They still had to install the hardware and buy all the equipment updates. to be able to update it. So satisfied. Yeah. Kathleen, let's do it. Graham Murray. No. McCampbell? Yeah. Raker? Yes. Phillips? Aye. Your Honor, I have a resolution approving the final plat of the Ron Lau subdivision. Second. Thank you. DT? This is a one lot subdivision located in the county two mile area, uh, pretty close to the city uh, limits off of Tamer Road. It's a, a little over four acre uh, lot. Um, it's splitting off the basically the homestead from the larger lot uh, with the farm ground to remain separate. Um, so this is located adjacent to and uh, north of 113th Street. Um, so just a little more reference, just north of the water treatment uh, facility there on Taylor <coughs> Road. Uh, so the larger lot is this in red and then some of this farm ground that goes off of the map, but they're just splitting off this portion in black, uh, which is essentially just the home there um, and retaining that. So. It's a one lot subdivision, but uh, with this, they're just retaining the existing house and keeping the farm ground separate. Uh, the area in light green here is where the city limits are. Anything not shaded in green is in the county. Questions from the audience? I see none. Council? None here. Good. Anybody, are you good? I'm great. Okay. <clears throat> Kathleen, let's finish it. Graham Murray? Aye. Mr. Campbell? <laughs> Aye. Breaker? Yes. Phillips? Aye. You have one more. Res uh, Your Honor, I have a resolution approving the purchase of the Heil automated, automated front loader garbage truck with the Corato can. Second. Don? This item was on the consent agenda, and I pulled it off to put on the regular agenda because I added some wording to the council item that was in your work session packet. I felt appropriate that it be mentioned here at this meeting. Also, the price of the truck was an approximation and it had since received the accurate number. So I felt again that it was appropriate to bring it forth as a regular agenda item. Um, these bullets that are on the uh, screen are from your council item that you have in your packet. Um, but I wanted to touch base with them because uh, I think that they're important to take in consideration of what we're doing. Um, some pluses to using the fully automated truck. Uh, more customers are served in the same amount of time than served by semi-automatic collection. Uh, routinely, there's only one operator on the truck. Uh, semi-automated collection, typically, you usually would have two or even three people on a truck in semi-automation. That's what we currently have, a rear load truck with uh, tippers, cart tippers mounted on the sill of the hopper. And uh, 
We try to put two men per truck, but there's a lot of times when there is only one man on a truck. The fully automated truck is designed for a one-man operation. Um, with the operator remaining in the cab, there's less exposure to traffic. The individual being struck, hit by a moving vehicle that may result in serious injury or death. Uh, we have had some near misses in the city of Burlington. Um, our drivers have not been very happy about it, but there's not much you can do when the vehicle goes speeding by. Uh, we have talked to the police in the past, and you know, if we don't have any kind of video evidence as they do with some types of service vehicles, I think maybe uh, some of the city buses may have video recordings where it can capture the car, uh, the license plate. We don't have that. So without proof, even if we could write it down, I've it seen doesn't it. get it done. I've seen it happen. <clears throat> I think there's a, a law that was changed within the last 24 months that indicate that service vehicles such as trash, garbage collection trucks are to be treated in the same way where the drivers of passenger vehicles are supposed to slow down and give them a wide berth because of the potential of hitting a worker in the area. I may even have a video in my office that would, could be put you know, on the city's uh, website for viewing, but um, it has, there have been some near bis misses in Burlington. Fortunately, it hasn't happened. With a fully automated truck, the man, it, it, the design of the system is that he stays inside the cab thereby avoiding the exposure to uh, tra traffic. Next slide. And then finally, uh, it does, being a fully automated truck and the way it works, it eliminates strains and injuries that uh, occur due to the pulling and the pushing of these carts, as well as the knee, the ankle, the foot injuries that can occur with the getting off of and onto the truck <clears throat> and the walking on the slippery or irregular street and alley surfaces. Uh, people do turn their ankles, people do step into a pothole. Uh, they do slip on ice or slippery surfaces, wet leaves on the surface, especially when they're trying to manhandle a cart. It has wheels, which makes it easier, but you're still pulling and pushing on irregular surfaces. and. If the man is, or the woman, the, the driver is able to stay within the cab and operate using a joystick and the arm, then they're not exposed to those surfaces. Okay, next slide. But also, with pluses, there are minuses. Just about with any program, you have the plus and you have the minuses that goes with it. Uh, the fully automated truck purchase price is significantly more than a rear loader. Um, the annual maintenance cost on some fully automated trucks, the arms are higher than the annual cost of maintaining a, maintaining a rear loader. Uh, some of the fully automated trucks need replacing sooner than a rear loader. As I mentioned last week, we have some rear loaders that are up to 20, at 20 years, 21 years old still functional. Um, it's not uncommon to see uh, fully automated trucks being replaced somewhere in the range of five, no more than 10 years. And it's really time to replace that truck. So your investment for a higher cost truck, uh, you find yourself replacing it at a higher frequency than you typically would with a rear load truck. Next uh, slide. Uh, efficiency greatly depends on the customer locating and orienting the cart where the operator can stay in the cab, the arm can get to the cart without causing damage to the truck or to property. Uh, in some cases, um, if the uh, cart isn't in the right place or uh, it's not oriented correctly, maybe it's against a telephone pole or a mailbox, which m many of our customers use that to help support the cart, keep it upright. 
Uh, you cannot grab it with the claw because you've got a solid anchored object with the cart. So the customer has to have the cart set in the proper location. Many of these programs, when I've researched them, indicate that you should have the cart positioned so that, that there's nothing within three feet of the cart. So the arm can freely claw, can freely access the cart and take it to be dumped. Um, if the man has to get out of the cab, you've just lost the efficiency associated with that piece of equipment and the type of program because he's spending time getting out and walking over and moving the cart to some place where it can be uh, grabbed by the claw. Now the particular truck we're looking at has controls on the outside of the cab so if he does have to get out of the cab to remove the object to empty that container he can empty it while he's out before getting back in the truck. Um, if it's up against the garage or up against the shed, again, the arm or the claw can't grab around it. Uh, if they put it behind a boat in the alley or behind a car in an alley or on the street, you can't get at the cart. The man has to get out of the truck if he's going to empty the cart. Or the alternative would be that you simply leave the cart uncollected and go on your way. The operating space needed for the truck sometimes requires a set-out location to be moved from alley pickup to curbside. Uh, there's a community um, that I contacted that was having a lot of trouble because in the alleys, their alleys were narrow and they were winding alleys and they were uh, hitting eaves and garages and the truck was, the arm was getting damaged in trying to access the cart. And they ultimately moved the entire community, which was entirely alley collection, to curbside. Next uh, slide. In red, I, the, some of the wording that I added, nothing real major. In order to make use of your improved efficiency that a fully automated truck can provide you, that means more customers served in the same amount of time than served by the semi-automatic collection. The fully automated truck tends to be longer. It's less maneuverable. I don't know if you've had varying lengths of cars or pickup trucks with extra long beds or driven vans, short vans, long vans. The longer the truck, the less maneuverable it tends to be. Uh, it's not that you can't drive it, it's just that you have to pay attention. You maybe are hitting a curb or an island that's out in the street more often than you would if you had a less, uh, a shorter vehicle. Uh, it has higher capacity. Uh, more collections mean more cubic yards and associated weight, putting additional weight on the city streets and the alley surfaces. I mentioned last week that this truck will have dual rear axles and we, all, we are also outfitting the truck with larger than standard sized tires which help distribute the extra weight that this truck is going to be carrying. Why does it have to be a larger truck? Well, if you're picking up more houses in the same amount of time in a work day, you're going to have more weight on that truck. You have to have the space the capacity on that truck in order to put that extra garbage or you've got to be willing to go dump it someplace and then come back and pick up where you left off because you want to use that uh, the effectiveness of that truck. Some communities such as I think Muscatine have a transfer station within the city limits. So making a second trip or going out and dumping the truck and then going ahead and getting back on the route isn't a big deal. But if you have to drive any kind of distance, then the question is, is it worth having that truck if you're going to end up only using part of the day and parking it or taking a round trip out there and losing that time so you can pick up where you left off? Uh, next slide. Okay, I wanted to hit on this too. Approximately 50% of our collections in the city are in alleys. Uh, in alleys, with the fully automated truck, 
you're looking at two passes are required if, if, if trash carts are on both sides of the alley. The backyard of this house on this side has their cart on that side of the alley and the house that's on that side of the alley has their cart at that side of the, side of the alley. The arm is on one side. So uh, if you live on a dead-ended alley, you pull in, picking up the carts, then you back out, you turn around, and you back back down again to pick up the carts on the other side. You're making four passes. So two passes or four passes if you leave the carts where the carts are currently setting. To make use of the truck, it's a typically a heavier truck, you've got to make two or four passes in alleys depending upon the circumstances. Some cities will move carts from the alley to the curb so they don't need to be doing that double time or quadruple time on the alley surface. Uh, some cities, I mentioned last week that I was aware of a community that required the customers on the alley, one side had to put their carts on the other side for collection day. Uh, I've talked to that person uh, since last week's meeting to find out if he was still there because when he first implemented the program, people there were nuts. people were upset. They are doing that program and have been doing it for several years where the people move their cart from one side to the other. It increases the efficiency significantly because you make one pass through the alley and you get all the carts. Of course, there's a problem. Where does that second cart go? Is it on the apron of the garage of the neighbor and now they can't get in their garage? Whose cart is whose cart? You have my cart, I have your cart, you know. So they have labeling opportunities there. So if we go to a fully automated truck, about 50% of our alleys are, I mean, 50% of our collection is in alleys. And we'll have to decide how do we do that. My understanding, not having spoken to anybody personally about it, but in West Burlington, they do an S travel up and down. They go down one side of the alley, they drive over two blocks, they go down that side of the alley. They come back, they go down the center alley, and then they go back and get the first alley on the other side, and they've got a pattern that they follow. But they drive the alley surfaces twice to get both sides picked up. And communities can do that. Last bullet, or maybe that's not the last bullet. When a fully automated truck is offline, that means that a means must be found and utilized to make up for the lost efficiency. If you've got a truck that's picking up 50% more houses, I don't think that's realistic in Burlington, but a significantly more number of houses, if that truck goes offline, you put one of the rear loads, semi-automated collection, which are slower process and hopefully two men on that truck, you've got to make up for that lost capacity that that truck not that is now down and take the time and have to have the personnel to get it done. Next slide. So we are at decision time. You have a, um, you have a uh, resolution in your packet that is seeking that if a fully automated truck for use in the Burlington Solid Waste Program is desired, um, I do believe we should continue the semi-automated semi collection, which along with using our upgraded uh, rear loaders and then supplement those trucks with the proposed high automated front loader with the Corrado can, which is on the resolution to approve the purchase of that truck. Well, let's tilt the audience. They're looking like they've got something to say. Questions or concerns from the audience? I see none. Council, let's deal with it. Questions, peanut butter? Go ahead. Well, I just, I think your last uh, statement kind of says that. So given some of the cons, I assume you're going to look at restructuring some of the routes maybe to be able to utilize the efficiency of the Corrado can versus the rear loaders. Is that any thought to that? Or are you just... We, ha we, have, we have, we have, we've tried to figure out, okay, how will we use this truck? What neighborhoods? Okay. Uh, you know, we feel Monday's route, as is, 
we can keep the truck busy. Tuesday's route as is, we can keep the truck busy. Wednesday's route has a lot of alleys, a lot of alleys. And uh, uh, some of them are in relatively good shape, some not so much, terraced properties. Uh, there's a lot of issues that we have to look at there t in order to try to make this truck work and keep it busy. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we think we can do it without too much. But it's going to have to be something that we have to have the truck on site and using it and figure out. We may have to reconfigure some of the routes. Uh, we don't want to do that, but in order to keep the truck uh, going, um, we feel that that will be necessary. Uh, we don't currently, I don't currently view Burlington as a community where we would take everybody to curbside. And we, I don't really want to do that, and I don't personally think that that would be very practical and responsible to do so. Now, the, all, the converse side of that would be picking and choosing certain places where alley pickup is great, but there's not really a strong reason why they can't be curbside. So we may end up moving additional houses. I've moved some alleys to curbside over the last few years, block here, a block there, and we've done that. And uh, I suspect that we will have to do some more in order to keep the truck busy. Whether we look at doing something by having all the carts in an alley placed on the same side, that sounds very attractive as far as being efficient. If your goal is efficiency, you tell the customer this is what you're going to have to do in order for you to have your garbage picked up. This is the most efficient method for us to do. The alternative would be to do nothing. And going back to my presentation last week, I mentioned that budget time. I said I would feel like we need to hire another man. We definitely need to buy a truck this year. But rather than buying a fully automated truck, we'd buy a rear load outfitted for semi-automated collection. That extra man should enable us to do and leave things as is. No changes in locations. But that costs more money. It costs $80,000 a year for a full-time worker and benefits. And that's an annual cost. Plus, there's always the potential that that one person may get hurt uh, one of the driving forces of communities that go to fully automated, one of the statements they make is worker comp claims, the amount of money we're paying for injuries and such. And so you'd still, ha you'd, still, you'd still have that issue mm -hmm. out there. But I do not see <laughs> us, this community, going fully automated and li in li eliminating the issue with workers potentially being hurt because they're manually managing the carts. I think it's going to stay. Thanks. Thanks for the answer, Don. Council, any other questions for Don? My concern is with 50% of the customers having alleys, <clears throat> what is the pushback when you approach a neighborhood and say, hey, we've got to have you move it to the curb? Typically, uh, we receive a few calls. Um, I've been visited at my office by a couple of gentlemen to talk to me. Um, Were they in black suits? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the conversations were uh, informative and uh, I don't know, fruitful from my standpoint in that the change in location remained the same. Um, how the customer felt about that in the long term, I don't know. I think that people don't like change, but they realize that sometimes changes come even though they don't like them. A lot of communities are going to fully automated. There's no question about it. Um, communities smaller than Burlington, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, so the, my next question is, the truck has less life. How much fewer? So This it truck costs more, but that less, I've, less. Uh, I'm proposing is a, what I would call a commercial truck, a commercial grade truck. Uh, I believe the truck itself will last up to 20 years. The Corrado can, which is in front, that has the arm incorporated on it, 
I could see that lasting somewhere between five and eight years. And I think I was asked last week, what does the replacement for that Corrado can cost? And it's approximately $32,000. Now, of course, as time progresses, that cost is going to go up. Sure. But that truck itself is, I think, the reliability of that truck is going to last out to 20 years. So, so the old Corrado can when it's done, that's just scrap metal? That's all, that's, that's all that is? I would say that when you're done with it, it's not going to be worth a whole lot. Uh, certainly, you can pull it in and, and hold it and reserve so that it might work perfectly fine for a relatively short period of time without any significant problems while you're using a second Corrado can. I did speak to the salesman about would you recommend or suggest that we purchase a second one just to have it on hand and he said no. He did not think that that was something we needed to do this early in the ball game. What was the reasoning behind, behind only getting five to eight years out of the Corrado can? Was it just rust out from the inside? Well, it's, that's it's the, more the arm. It's got a lot of wearing wear parts. I mean, we you obviously grease it, uh, you know, regularly, and you uh, adjust this and tighten that. But it's just simple the number of collections or pickups that it does. Most of the wear on the truck's probably going to be on that can, right? Yes. So. The the can itself is really like a a container. Yeah. It's the arm that does all the work. Um, the Containers made out of steel. You can probably reinforce it some, but it will have the tendency to rust out. And uh, like anything that is coming in contact with garbage, over time it's going to rust. Have we uh, have we ever looked into spraying any of our equipment um, uh, with a water hose? Lining, <laughs> uh, 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 lining it. You know, uh, we've done that at the wastewater treatment plant for the beds on the trucks that we haul our biosolids to, uh, you know, protect them against the, uh, uh, con the characteristics of biosolids. Um, as far as garbage trucks, I'm not aware that there's ever been anything done with that. I don't know. I don't know that I've. I didn't ask that question about if they have like, do you have undercoating for vehicles? Do you have like an inside coating for the Corrado can that would help it. But, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that gets banged around inside a container such as that. Yeah. You guys satisfied? I'm good. Thanks, Don. All right, Kathleen, let's go to it. Graham Murray. Aye. Campbell. Yes. Rinker. Yes. Phillips. Aye. Okay, uh, now's the time we'll take uh, comments from the audience. Um, we will not be having discussion at this point, um, but we will definitely listen to what you have to say. Any comments tonight? I see none. You guys have just been fantastic tonight. A little bit quiet, but a lovely crowd tonight. Um, Mr. Tesla? While we're talking trash, just a reminder again, the 2019 fall trash drop-off. Uh, October 29th from 10 to 6 p.m. at the parking lot south of the auditorium. Uh, similar setup to previous years where there'll be uh, large uh, trash containers that individuals can come down, show your ID or uh, water bill to show your Burlington resident. Um, and then you can drop off your trash or uh, items there. Uh, again, similar items that are not accepted for normal trash pickup, appliances, batteries, tires, demo material, electronics, TVs, and computers. Uh, those are not accepted items, uh, can bring uh, just general uh, cleanup items or uh, trash there. Uh, you do have to self-haul uh, and self-load or unload. Um, so you have to have the ability to uh, dispose of your uh, items that you bring down on your own into the trash containers. There would not be uh, staff on hand to unload large or bulky items. So uh, just try and be aware of that. But. Um, again, uh, October 29th from 10 to 6 at the South Auditorium parking lot. Okay. That's all you got? Mm -hmm. All right. Kathleen, anything tonight? Anything. We appreciate 40 years and how many days now? <laughs> okay. Just figured I'd ask. Peanut butter. Sounds like a great program, Eric. 
I want to thank you to everyone who volunteered their time and merchandise to Heta Gilbert this weekend. We had a great sale. The weather cooperated. And again, this goes to fund uh, underfunded children's medical and dental needs. So we're down 26 members. People have moved away. People have died. So if you're interested in joining Heta Gilbert, see me, call me, or email me. Thank you. Is that how you're supposed to say it? Well, my husband always thinks I say head of Gilbert, so I'm especially enunciating the T's. Okay. Well done. Well done. Counselor. Um, t tomorrow night, just to clarify, 5 to 6.30 here in the uh, city council chambers, we have our uh, debate forum with the three candidates. Thank you, Chris, for coming tonight. I also know that the media has uh, released various profiles. Uh, on, on different sites. So we really would love it if we had a, a full house here to see uh, who we're going to select for our, our two seats. Counselor? Uh, to reiterate what John said, uh, look forward to tomorrow night's debates um, and uh, the upcoming elections. If, if you weren't aware, the school board uh, debates are taking place right this minute. So if uh, when you're done watching us, you can uh, flip over to them. Sounds good. James? City Day. Did you attend that? I was going to say something about it. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you want me to say something about it, James? Uh, City Day down at the depot. Normally a City Day at the park, but we had it down at the depot this year. Uh, it was phenomenal. Just want to give a shout out to Rhonda, who was there. I have my leaf that uh, she let me cut out, and then they kicked me out of their station. Uh, Don gave me nothing, but um, uh, Don is always there every year, and we appreciate that. You still cannot, you'll never be able to top. I think it was my first year as mayor where you had the little water testing and all of that. I still have one of those. That was the coolest. Uh, but he didn't have that this year, but um, it, was a, it was a good showing, and we had a nice crowd that came down. Um, kids had a really good time, and I got some feedback. Uh, my sister, uh, she uh, called and let me know that uh, she had one of her kids, uh, one of her kids' parents said, my, my kid was down there and just had a great time and got a, Got a bracelet from the mayor and some other stuff, you know. Um, it, it was just a good time. The kids had a great time. They had fake jewelry on and stuff. We, we built uh, the city of Burlington. They made a little deal in the middle. And it was like the, it was just like a plat of ground. And we had cereal boxes, so they had to fill out a uh, building permit and decide what they were going to build. And then I had to sign off on it, on it. And then they took crayons and built, you know, colored whatever building they were doing. They placed it where they wanted to. It was... Uh, it was a good time. And me and the kids, of Bur we, we built the city of Burlington, and we did it together. That's what I kept, that's what I kept saying all day. But it was, uh, it was a fantastic time, and um, I just look forward to that every year. And I'll tell you what, um, even next year, I'm going to be looking forward to City Day, going down to see what's going on, and to see if maybe Don comes out with the cool stuff uh, again so I can get another one of those. Um, also, just want to give a shout-out to, uh, to Annie, who's not here tonight. Uh, she has some uh, things going on, but Annie, we're just going to give you a shout out, and I hope all, everything is okay with you. Um, oh, and I just want to also give a shout out, just real quick. We're going to recognize him at the next meeting, uh, but Will Woodard, he's a seventh grader at Notre Dame, and he won the If I Were Mayor contest. Oh, right. He wrote a phenomenal, uh, I'll tell you, when I, when I read it, um, I, I said, man, I said, he was like he was writing it for me. I mean, he cut out all the fluff, and he just was direct and to the point, and I thought it was well thought out, and I thought uh, some of the things that he brought up, I, I thought uh, uh, were, were genuine, uh, genuine points and uh, uh, deserved recognition. So I'm looking forward to recognizing uh, Will Woodard. I told him down at City Day, I said, if you hear somebody yell, Will Woodard, I said, you see a black shiny head, I said, you know it's me, man, you know it's me. So uh, just, just proud about that, uh, young kids trying to, make a difference in being involved in the community, and Will Woodard, uh, he's a good one in our community, so looking forward to that. Um, that's it. James? I don't have anything. Linda has one more thing. I, I forgot to mention that it is a Lead Exposure Prevention Week. Thank you. We have a lot of lead-based paint in our community, being an older community that Burlington is, and there's a lot that you can do prevention-wise, and some of that is nutritionally, so near and dear to my heart. So eat a high-protein diet and um, lots of fruits, um, high, high iron content too. So the red meats are important, combined with the high vitamin C foods, and it lowers your risk from having problems with the lead-based paint.
So there you have it. She's the nutrition magician, so she knows what she's talking about. Just want to, before I close out, I forgot to mention this, but uh, some of you don't know, uh, Jim was on the cover of, uh, of the Rolling Stones. What was, what was the magazine? Faucets. I can't remember, but Jim was in a magazine. Faucets. And they were, yeah, they were doing something the about from, from the desk of Jim. And he shared some things about himself. But this is something that you probably don't know about, Jim. But he also doubles as a volleyball coach. I heard he's really horrible, but oh, anyways, I just want to get that out. Mistake. What's Currents. that? It's currents. Currents. He's on the covers. No, he's inside. He's on like the third page. <laughs> and he's wearing the same shirt and tie, I might add. <laughs> it was a Monday. <laughs> so we're all pretty pleased about this. This guy, he loves his schedule. Anyways, if you ever get a chance to catch him, Coach, you don't want to. So if there's nothing else, can I get a motion to close? Motion to close. Second. second. Moved in second. Kathleen. Graham Murray. Yes, please. Campbell. Yes, please.